Hey, everyone. Well, I'm here with my good friend Chuck Harris uh, to talk about what I feel is one of the most important uh, things for a worship team and for your church. Um, I've always said uh, the most important person on my team is the sound engineer because uh, I can say this from experience, a, a bad sound engineer can sabotage all of the work your worship team has done. And I've had, uh, I've been on a stage with a sound engineer messing with my voice and changing the EQ and adding kind of weird effects and um, uh, echoes to my voice. And it's really distracting to me on the stage when I'm trying to sing and I hear this weirdness going on and I I want to run back there and say, don't touch a thing. And pastors, uh, you know what I'm talking about as well, because you can be preaching, and if the sound engineer is is constantly giving you feedback or, or messing with the EQ on your voice, it really is disruptive, and it can mess with your train of thought. And I think, I, I think really affect how the people receive the Word of God. So uh, the importance of, of a sound engineer goes way beyond the worship team it's i think i think it's the most important position you can get in your church uh because pastors if if you're preaching the word and the people can't hear it uh that's a problem uh also uh today we're building some sophisticated large churches and they're beautiful and the seats are comfortable and the facility looks great but they ran out of money and they just skimped on the pa system so you got a beautiful facility and a PA system that's that's capable of of serving a church of about two or three hundred people, and and you built a church for ten thousand, big problem. So uh, I, this is a uh, an issue that is very very important to me. I've said all along, if I have to, uh, if I can only afford to take one other person on the road with me, I'll take my sound engineer because uh, I, my life is in his hands. Uh, your life is in your sound engineer's hands, and and you better pray that God sends you the right person uh, to help out in that position. It, don't just pick anybody who wants to spin some knobs and, and feel uh, a sense of control back there. Really pray that God sends you that person. I'm telling you, he is the most important person of your team. Uh, having said that, I'm here uh, today with Chuck Harris, and Chuck has been around the world with me. Almost 20 years we've traveled together. You have been in every situation imaginable, and uh, uh, and and somehow you've survived. Uh, Chuck is a real good a balance, a real good feedback to me. Uh, that's the wrong word to use. Feedback. That's a bad <laughs> I'm good word. At that. But 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 <laughs> Chuck is a, is a good sounding board to me because I'm on the stage. But I always ask Chuck, how was it from your perspective? And he's out in the audience again, uh, where the people are, and and he sees it from a different perspective all the time. All through the Gospels, um, in in Matthew eleven fifteen, Jesus said, "He who has ears to hear, let him hear." Uh, Matthew 13, 9. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You can go through all the Gospels, and Jesus uh, said that all the time because it's important that you hear the message. Uh, Hear it here so that you can hear it here. But it has to start uh, in your ears. you got to hear the message. And boy, I I can't stress enough the importance of finding uh, the right sound engineer. Um, Romans, uh, what is it, 10, 17? Mm-hmm. Um, Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing. <laughs> so uh, this is a pretty important subject, and a lot of times we just kind of you know, scoot over the top of it because uh, uh, maybe we're intimidated by all the, the bells and whistles, but I'm going to ask Chuck today uh, to talk about... Um, the, the practical role of a sound engineer, uh, you know, talking about servanthood, we've talked a lot about this in our general session with all the musicians. It's all about serving, uh, but also kind of get into the nuts and bolts. Um, I, I know we're limited a little bit in this setting. Uh, when we shot the general session, uh, we are in 
a, a, a beautiful studio, Ocean Way, here in Nashville, Tennessee. And it's a, a, a world-class studio with a world-class board. And it's a, it's kind of a dream uh, for Chuck to be mixing in that studio. But it's, it's, a, it's a dream that doesn't happen all the time. The reality is um, most of the time we're on the road in, in, in a setting like we were a, a month ago for 65 people or 200 people and a few months ago for 600,000 people. So Chuck is in a different environment all the time, but I'm going to ask him, I'm going to kind of um, uh, be quiet as much as I can <laughs> and let D- Chuck talk uh, to us about uh, the importance of uh, the right attitude of serving, how he, how he thinks about uh, running sound, and then get into some of the nuts and bolts as well, I- I- as much as we can in this sure. setting to talk about uh, some practical things. But um, without uh, any further ado, help me welcome Chuck Harris. Uh-huh. Thank you, Glad Don. you're here. Uh, glad to be here. Yeah, I did want to talk about the the role of, of the sound man in the church or the audio engineer. The first thing to think about is is the fact that you're there as a servant. It's so important that you understand that role that you play in that you are the guy that's behind the scenes making a lot of it happen Mm -hmm. for those who are on the platform. So they're the ones who really kind of have their reputations and their... Um, they're being vulnerable and exposed on the platform in front of the congregation or the audience. And, um, and you're the guy that's kind of in the back helping them accomplish that. So sometimes we, as, as uh, just human nature, I think we kind of make ourselves the center of the show and, and it's all about us. But really, as the audio engineer, we're there to provide support give them what they need, the tools they need to communicate from the platform. So they're going to be preaching, they're going to be singing, they're going to be playing their instruments, leading worship, and we're going to be making sure that everything they do on the platform translates to the congregation. And uh, and so we don't get all all the accolades or the recognition that Mm. that the people on the platform get, but boy, like, like Don was just saying, they really do rely on us. And um, and that's right. You you, right. you rarely get the accolades. You, <laughs> you, you only uh, the, the sound men only get uh, feed only only get uh, input from the congregation when something's wrong. Um, yep. it, sadly, uh, no, nobody ever walks out and and said, "Boy, this." Well, they do in our concerts. They walk They'll out. And walk say, out. Yeah. This is the best sound that I've ever heard. And I hear this a lot with Chuck on the road. But uh, usually, that's a hot seat in any church. Mm-hmm. And um, m- more times than you care to think about, probably people have come to you and said, "Turn the drums down." Yeah, and and it's not always Chuck's fault because we're in a in, we're in a building that's uh, it, it's so live, and and we talk about this in our rhythm uh, rhythm section um, DVD, and especially in the live band, the the general session we did, we talk a lot about. Uh, Tim talks about. Uh, using brushes and different techniques. So mm-hmm. make sure you uh, get a hold of those DVDs as, as well. But yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, I, you know, when you say that, if, I, if I'm if i sitting at the board and I see somebody walking towards me with <laughs> like something to say, I know, okay, here it comes. Yeah. Um, I w- we were in one church once and they, uh, they actually have a gumball machine at the sound booth that's full of earplugs. People can like oh put in a quarter gosh. and buy a set of earplugs. So you know that they've got problems because <laughs> yeah. that's the way that they do it. The other thing that you want to be as a sound person is dependable. Um, if, if you're not thinking ahead, if you're not planning ahead and preparing everything in advance and you're, you're kind of there showing up when the band and everybody else is showing up, there's a sense of panic that happens there if you're, if you're not well prepared ahead of time. And you want to be that guy that people can rely on and they know, okay, Chuck's going to be there or so-and-so is going to be there and I know that everything's going to be okay because they're going to take care of all of the details. So sound the sound person is always, in my opinion, should be the first one there and the last one to leave uh, at any event, any service or concert that you're doing um, to make sure that things are prepared. And so if you're dependable, you're a servant, you're dependable, you're trustworthy, um, they're going to really rely on you and feel good about it. Um, self-starting is very important as well. 
Because if you think about it, if you're if you're the main audio guy in your church or girl in your church, um, there's nobody around in your sphere who really knows or understands what you do the way that you do. So nobody's going to say, hey, you know, you really ought to um, think about soldering this cord or something. Mm-hmm. You you need to figure that out yourself and, uh, and, and th- anticipate problems, anticipate things that can be coming up and really be self-starting and, and take the initiative and do those things in advance. Mm-hmm. And again, that's because you're dependable and you've taken care of everything. Nobody might even notice that you've done all those things. They just know that everything's going smoothly now right. and, and I'm okay with that. The other thing that um, I like to ask whenever I'm in a setting, when I'm teaching engineers, I'll ask them this question, are you a musician? And usually about a third of the room, most of the guys are usually, yeah, I'm a bass player, but I figured I can't make any money at it, so, I, <laughs> so I, I'm a sound man too. But um, a lot of times there are people there that say, no, I'm not a musician. And I would posit this theory that, oh, yes, you are a mm. musician, because um, if you're mixing sound for a band while they're playing music, you're interpreting the music. You have to think musically. You have to think um think artistically, you have to make decisions that are going to help, again, help that music translate in the most effective, emotional, clear way. And so, yes, you you are a musician. They used to call George Martin the producer of the Beatles. They used to call him the fifth Beatle. Mm. And uh, so I think that, um, yeah, you you really do need to think of yourself as a musician. You know, um, I, I know we're not in a, like I said, we're not in an ideal setting here. Um uh, like we were at Ocean Way, mm-hmm. where you can um, talk about some of the uh, the real practical nuts and bolts. Right. Uh, w- w- what is this? What is a signal path? You, can you share some mm-hmm. of the, some of the stuff on that? Yeah. If you think about a signal path, um, it's really easy. You've got a sound that originates somewhere, and in this case, it's our voices. Uh, so you have a signal, or it could be a guitar, or electric guitar, acoustic guitar, a drum, whatever it is. You've got that source that you would consider, and it needs to follow a path in order mm-hmm. to get out to where the congregation or the audience is sitting. And so that path generally entails you've got a microphone and a cable that runs along, and you go somewhere uh, back to the mixing console in the back of the room, and the mixing console has its own signal path. The signal makes its way through that, and the, that's where the engineer does most of his work at the board making all those decisions. So it goes through an input section, a mic preamp, then into like your EQs, maybe into some compression, and then uh, out you, you bust it out to the master, and then it goes out to your, your output section of the signal path, which would be um, into amplifiers, speaker processors, ultimately speakers, and then into the room to interact with, with the, uh, with the congregation again. So that would be your your basic concept of a signal path: the starting from here and getting to there. Um, that's pretty easy, and um, so th- those are your your various pieces of equipment that you have to deal with: the microphones, all of the miscellaneous stuff the mixing board, the the output signal path, and the speakers. Um, and there's probably um, a, a whole price range of, I mean, you can go from $500 mixing board to mm-hmm. a uh, $100,000 mixing board. Absolutely. Um, you know, how much is too much? And for the pastors that are watching this, and the uh, maybe the maybe the church board uh, budget committee mm-hmm. trying to figure out what mm-hmm. can we spend mm-hmm. uh, on our PA system. Is there kind of a rule of thumb? Like, yeah. how, how, if you if you spend X number of dollars building your church, how much should you spend on sound? Yeah, yeah. The the rule of thumb there is, I mean, this, this is approximate, but I've been told that if you've got a new building campaign and you're building a new sanctuary and uh, you're going to install a sound system, that 10% of your budget should mm. be allocated to wow. your your sound and lights kind of system. So, so. if you build a uh, $2 million church, uh-huh. $200,000, yep. $200,000 for a sound system. Yep. Did I just hear somebody fall off of the chair? <laughs> uh, was that you, Pastor? <laughs> oh, maybe it was your, the chairman of your board, but 
again, going back to what we talked about when we started the session, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, you're the pastor of this church because God has has raised you up to be the pastor. You're the worship leader because God's put you there. It's so important that the people can hear what God's put in your heart. It's not about an ego. It's just it's about it's about making your your building. It's just facilitating and equipping it so they can hear the message and receive the word of faith and act upon it. It's it. I don't want to over spiritualize it, but I can't stress enough the importance of addressing this issue in your churches. Mm-hmm. The reality is that uh, yeah, that the equipment is only a small part of it. The acoustics in your room are crucial. Uh, I used to live in San Francisco, and a number of years ago, they built Davies Hall, which was where the uh, the San Francisco Symphony played. Mm-hmm. And uh, they spent, I forget, it was like $40 million building this building uh, in the 70s. And they got it, and you know they hired the best acousticians and the best PA people and all of that stuff to get it done right. And they built it, and they put the symphony in there, and they started playing, and it sounded terrible. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, and they, they missed the boat on the acoustics in there. And, so they, and that's so important for a symphony because they're not relying so much on the PA as they are on the room itself. So they spent $11 million redoing it. So if you've built a church and you're you're kind of married to the design that you had in your church, uh, be willing to rethink. It's like writing a song. You have to, you know, you might have written a great song, but, you know, you have to be willing to rethink and tweak and change. And so um, so I, I was in a church once uh, consulting a little bit, and the pastor said, well, no, the acoustics are awesome in our church. He said, it's, this church was designed like a Shakespearean playhouse, so you can stand on the stage and talk and without a PA, and it'll sound great. And I said, well, that's awesome. You ought to be doing Shakespeare then, because um, yes, the, the, the problem is you've put a band in here with drums and electric guitars, mm-hmm. and you can't understand a word that's coming out of anybody's mouth, and, and there it's just noise in the room because it's too live. So you need to tone down the room with some acoustics. So I'm not an acoustician, but um, the reality is you want to, you know, sound is physics, and sound travels through the air. It's waveforms, and it travels through the air. It bounces off of walls, and it reflects, and it goes goes around the room. And, it, and depending on how the room is shaped, what the walls are made out of, the ceiling, the floors, all of that stuff affects how sound interacts with the room. So what you want to do is you want to treat the room with some uh, acoustic treatment, being either absorbers so that sound won't bounce, it'll hit it and stay there, or diffusers so when it does hit it, it diffuses off in a better um, pattern so that it's not um, it's it's not creating feedback and, and weird modes modal things in the room where the frequencies are are aligning with each other and all that kind of weird stuff so so is there um is that an expensive proposition to uh to treat your church uh, acoustically um is it as expensive as a as like uh, putting in the proper pa system right um actually you want to be careful because you can't choose one over the other. Um, mm. Your acoustics is just as important as your PA. If you're if you haven't treated your acoustics well, you're not necessarily going to overcome all those problems with just PA. So, so yes, it can be expensive to do acoustic treatment in your church, but it's but it's it's really necessary. If you have handy guys in your church, there are a, a number of websites where you can go to some D. Um, do-it-yourself kind of websites where you can build different absorbers and things like that. But that's a lot of work, but it's, it's worth it. You know, um, it's a, it's a real, it's a real fine line, uh, with acoustic, uh, acoustics in your building, because, mm-hmm. uh, I've been in a lot of churches that, um, they, they've been in a small church, a small setting, mm-hmm. and then they build their brand new facility and they, treated acoustically, it's so dead that they move into this facility and it's like uh, people aren't worshiping anymore. Yeah. It's it's a weird, it's a fine line that you walk, I think, in this because there's something wonderful about hearing people sing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, when was the last time in your church that 
the musicians stopped and the people lifted their voices and sang. You get a thousand people just singing. It's a beautiful sound, and we've forgotten about it because mm-hmm. we've got, I mean, we're rocking. We've got the great, we've got acoustic, acoustically treated stages. The drums can play loud, but the people sing and their their voice goes about this high above. Mm-hmm. So what happens is, uh, because it's so acoustically treated and so dead, you know, people think, why should I sing? I'm, I'm at a show. I'm going to watch the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a fine line because there's something wonderful about having some sense of your voice is going somewhere. The, mm-hmm. the, that's why acoustics uh, are, are so important in, in designing the church. And mm-hmm. it's better to do this when you're designing your church than trying to uh, retrofit it. Same with the PA system. I'm thinking about the church we were in. I won't mention any names, but <laughs> uh, they, had a, they had built onto the church. Uh, they had a PA system that was uh, adequate for 200 people. When the church grew to 400, they added a couple speakers and the church grew to 800 and to 1500. They kept adding on to the system, mm-hmm. but it didn't uh, get it. It was a Frankenstein system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. We co- Chuck called it the Frankenstein system, but <laughs> it was every, every room, every little place had a different set of speakers. And uh, what would have been the solution to that church? Well, the problem is that when you start doing stuff like that, and, and especially depending on who you have doing the work, is you could be creating more problems because you just like if you just tag a speaker on to the end, you're changing ohm loads and you're you're adding you know possible yeah. noise things and all of that stuff. So the right thing to do would be to say, okay, we're going to evaluate our situation. We've expanded. We've grown. Um, we need to probably bring in a professional person to say, what do we need to do and how do we do this right? Um, It could be that adding on is the right thing to do, but it could also be that, you know, it would be better to kind of gut parts of the system and put a whole new thing in instead of just adding little speakers Mm -hmm. here and there. Well, let's talk about um, some of the real practical applications. Mm -hmm. Um, Picking the right microphone is important. Yep. Um, uh, EQ, equalization. I'm going to ask Chuck uh, to talk about that and just give us some some practical uh, tips on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the first thing, the first things first, I have people ask me all the time, how do you get it to sound that good? And my, my stock answer, and it's a sincere answer, is it always starts with the band. Um, these guys know how to tune their drums and, and their guitars, and they get great tones. And so what we're, what we're uh, working with to begin with is a great source. Um, but beyond that, I have to figure out the best way to translate that source again to the to the congregation. So one of the very first tools that we use is a microphone, and you need to understand um, what microphones to choose for what applications and why they're best. You have basically um, two major groups of microphones that most churches would have access to. The first is dynamic mics, and that's what these, uh, this one is a dynamic mic. Um, it's a good old SM58, and it's actually a Beta 58 with a blue stripe on it here. But um, it's a good handheld vocal microphone, and it's going to give you a good present sound. Now, a dynamic microphone... Oh, excuse me. How, yeah. how much does that microphone cost? This microphone, you can pick it up for $125, okay. something like that. Okay. And a dynamic microphone doesn't need any power. It's, it's a passive thing, so it's got, a, it's got a diaphragm in there with a voice coil and a magnets, and it kind of gets its power through the magnets. And, um, and so it doesn't have a big frequency range. It's kind of warm and, and not real bright and not a real extended low frequency content, but, um, but it's a really good all around microphone for and, vocals. And durable as well. And durable. Yeah. It, yeah. It handles, and, yeah. and every manufacturer makes a dynamic, a version of the dynamic mics. Now there's different kinds, usually with the round ball or the larger windscreen on them like that, these would be vocal mics. And the reason for that is that you've actually got a windscreen in there. So our P's and H's don't pop as much mm-hmm. with them. And, um, and it's just a good all around mic. It also works great in a live setting being a dynamic mic. Cause it doesn't it's not as sensitive as other kinds of mics, which I'll talk about in a second. So with dr- loud drums and all of that stuff, it tends to behave itself and isolate more to the sound that is coming out of your voice. Don actually has a condenser mic there. It's a, a nice uh, Neumann mic. That one would go for about $700. 
And a condenser mic has um, is powered, so you actually get run power through the mic cable, uh, 48 volt phantom power we call it, and it's got um, you know electricity in it, and so it it's able to get a, a a wider frequency response, more highs, it's more sensitive. Um, they also come with different designs where you might use them for more distant miking on a choir. Um, overheads on drums, uh, acoustic guitars, things that need, you know, pretty, a lot of high end and a more sensitive kind of approach. So those are the two major groups. Um, within this, them, you've got different designs. You've got instrument mics and choir mics and vocal mics and drum mics and, and all of that. So it's important for you to make sure that you've got the right microphone for the right, um, thing. The other, the other thing that's interesting about microphones is the pickup pattern on them. They, they call it the polar pattern. Um, these both are condenser or um, are uh, cardioid pickup pattern. So that means it's heart shaped. You've got a, a lobe like this. And if you're looking at this mic, I'm going to just looking at this mic, it picks up more from this direction and it rejects from this direction. So you're able to um, aim it at something and kind of isolate extraneous noises from around it. You have other mics that might be omnidirectional that pick up equally from all sides. Mm -hmm. You also have microphones that are figure eight patterns and they might pick up from two sides and have rejection from from the opposite sides, the opposite yeah. corners there. We're talking a lot about live settings. Yeah. You know, a lot, mm -hmm. of, a lot of what we're talking about today is in, is in the light of a, a live setting, uh, live ministry time at your church. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, going back to our uh, general session at Ocean Way, mm -hmm. it was such a controlled environment. Right. We were playing live, mm -hmm. but when you get into a studio environment, then you can do these really nice microphones, and there's no other sound. You're in an isolated booth, mm -hmm. and, um, and and you can really get into the uh, into the sound of the vocal, pick the right mic for the right vocal, but... Uh, we're not dealing with that no. all, all the time. No, so you're we're trying not. to find a, a general setting. We're talking about uh, live sound in your church and, and practical things for your worship mm -hmm. team. Yeah. The other thing is how you aim the microphone. So, like, for example, on a drum set, think about it. You've got, you know, toms and snare and kick drum and cymbals, and you've got all this stuff, and you've got multiple mics all over your drum set. So you want to be careful about leakage and things um, on stage. So a lot of times you'll aim your mics, you'll get um, cardioid uh, pattern microphones and you'll aim them. So like if I'm aiming at a tom tom, I'm going to aim it away from the cymbals that are above it and aim it at the tom tom. So I'm not getting a lot of cymbals in the tom tom mic. And it's so important for you just to think through as you're setting up your microphones. That's why I would choose sometimes in concert, if we're on a big stage or Tim, the drummer is in a, a drum booth, I'll give Don this microphone because it's, it sounds good best on his voice. It's got all that great presence. But if we're on a live stage and it's a small stage and Tim's right behind Don, I'll use this microphone because, again, I don't have to worry as much about all the leakage uh, yeah. from the drums. What about uh, EQs? Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to talk about that? Because yep. uh, yep. I've seen some ch <laughs> some churches where they, uh, and I we, we saw it just recently, where they set the EQ uh, there's an equalization for the whole PA system, mm -hmm. and then there's EQs on every mic. Right. But I've seen in some settings where um, uh, the these the sound engineers get very, very territorial. And, and if you have a sound engineer, engineer like that in your church, uh, you need to <clears throat> say to him or her brother, sister, um, you need to take uh, six months' time out. <laughs> uh, because... Uh, there's there's just no room in any part of your church or anybody in kind of a, a, a worship role for an attitude like that. Uh, and I don't know what it is, Chuck, but sound engineers seem to get very territorial, more territorial than guitarist or, you know, and it I think maybe it's it's uh, passive aggressive. Maybe they have this board with all these knobs. And, and it's intimidating to a lot of the people in the church. They don't know uh, what all those knobs do. <laughs> and so they have a sense of power. And, and the sad thing is, if they're not the right person for the job, they're not going to hear 
uh, they're not going to EQ the building right. So there's an equalization for a building, and there's an equalization for right. uh, for each individual mic. So it, it, yeah. try to take the mystery out of that. Talk mm-hmm. about that a little bit. Yeah, I was. By the way, I was going to try to go to counseling for all that, but, um, <laughs> yeah, but right. yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, you do have. Don's exactly right. You've got you've got two sets of EQ. You've got you've got the usually what they call a graphic equalizer, and it's somewhere in your in your signal chain. Um, that you tune the room with, and it's the why would you tune a room? You ask. Well, the rooms based on the shape and the size of the room and the dimensions, the the number of feet from there. Again, like we talked about earlier with the acoustics, sound um, sound is waves, and different waves are some are long waves and some are short waves, and. Uh, and if you measure the space between two walls and sound is bouncing back and forth between those two walls, what you'll find is certain frequencies will tend to fold back on themselves, bounce back on each other, and they'll overlap in such a way that they actually accent each other. They, they overlap in phase, mm-hmm. and it puts a mode in the room where the room will, will ring. That's where the feedback comes from. When those particular frequencies, and a room will always feed back at, at the same frequencies, uh, or set of frequencies that are multiples of the lengths of the waves and all that. Mm. So what you need to do is you need to um, uh, tune the room. And these, you know, guys, the, the fancy way to do it is to come in with a, with, a e, with a computer with software on it and you shoot tones into the room and the computer analyzes the tones and it'll actually change the EQ settings for you because you put white noise in there, which is all the frequencies happening at the same time, and it's listening. You put a microphone out there and it listens and it analyzes which frequencies are, are overreacting and it pulls those frequencies down. The poor man's way to do it is to um, put your mics on stage and start turning up the volume until it starts feeding back. You figure you find that first frequency and you figure out what frequency it is and you pull it back on your graphic equalizer. And as soon as you've dealt with that frequency, you turn it up a little bit more until you get the next frequency. Mm. And once you've dealt with a, you know, three or four frequencies in the room, you've probably given yourself pretty good headroom. You now you can get the system pretty loud before it feeds back. So that's the room tuning. On the microphones themselves, on the individual things, I EQ everything, you know, so the bass drum, the snare drum, all of that stuff, uh, we start to shape, use that to, we're not necessarily fixing acoustic problems with the room as much as we are trying, because we've already done that, we're trying to shape the sound of, of the instrument or the voice in a way that is musical and makes sense for the song. And so... As a rule of thumb, <clears throat> they have what they call subtractive EQ, and that's kind of the best place to start is to figure out, okay, what frequencies are annoying here or don't sound good in, in this thing, and you start pulling those out. I liken it to uh, a sculptor who's got this big piece of rock and he wants to make um, a sculpture of something, a tree or whatever, and instead of like gluing stuff on the rock to make a tree he actually starts chiseling away at the rock and there's a tree in there somewhere and i'm going to get it out by by taking you know parts of the rock away and that's what we do with subtractive equalization we we pull out those frequencies to leave what's pleasing left and then once you've done that you might need to enhance a couple of frequencies you know bring up some some highs a little bit to bring out some more articulation in the voices things like that. So, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a shaping tool for, for your, uh, sound. What, what is, uh, you know, there, there's a certain frequency that, um, is real biting. Mm-hmm. If you're sitting in an audience and this, it, there's this frequency that just, just drills your ears. It, that, is that, is that three K? What is that? Yeah. It's somewhere around three, three to four K is that magic, uh, spot that, um, you know, God put in like babies' voices when babies cry so <laughs> yeah. that parents can hear it from way down the hall. Um, yeah. you know, and that's also the, the sound that just sometimes, especially certain people are really sensitive to it, but it'll be that one that's just like out that really hurts. Like yeah. your violin, I, I take, I always take the you see you have it plugged straight into a DI. Yeah. I always pull out like 3.15k like I just dive it at, all the way out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, cuz that's that real piercing sound and you get into a 
a church setting and it's just like, ow, it hurts my ears. That's usually, uh, if you're a sound engineer, that's that 3K biting, biting sound. And it's really uh, abrasive and it's not, it's just not a pretty sound. Um, uh, I'd almost rather have a real high feedback than that bitey 3K. <laughs> yeah. But there's just that, it seems like it's always the culprit. And then there seems to be a low, kind of a, there's a, like mm-hmm. whatever that is. What? Well, that depends. That's that depends on the room, okay. uh, but yeah, a lot of times in the vocal range, you normally will pull out oh anywhere from two to four hundred hertz in the low mids thing just to get that. Um, yeah. There's that that sort of warm muffly yeah. thing that happens, yeah. and it's funny like in a in like a kick drum, you think oh I've got it, I want it to be huge, so I need to add some lows to it, but really a lot of times the problem is that you've got something a little higher like a one sixty, a hundred to one hundred and sixty hertz, right. and if you pull that out, you it's counterintuitive. You would normally think okay it's a low frequency, I want to push it up, but a lot of times what you do is you pull that out, and it what it happens is that sound has been masking the lower stuff Mm -hmm. and you can't perceive the lower stuff so it's weird you you pull pull all that that frequency out like around 160 at a narrow band and all of a sudden you're hearing all that rich low sub stuff that you weren't hearing before and you go oh it actually sounds bigger and lower even though there's less information there yeah uh, you know, I don't know, uh, were you going to talk about monitors or would this be a good yeah. time to talk about the yeah, monitors? Yeah, let's do that. Um, we talked about picking the right microphone, but, you know, a lot of times, you know, Pastor, you're using, um, more and more I'm seeing guys use uh, these, these these uh, what do you call them, uh, wire, hand... Your headset mics. Yeah, yeah. Free, so their hands are free, headset mics. Uh but Where if, if you're if you're working with yeah if you're working with <laughs> monitors like we have on the stage here, uh, um, it, the monitors are going to feed back. If uh, you know just some basic techniques, you probably know this, but don't don't turn your microphone into the monitor because that's going to give you that feedback sound. And I see some pastors when there's a little bit of feedback, they pull back and they start they they start preaching from back here which means the sound man has got to bring up his volume a little bit more, mm-hmm. which means it's, it's only exas- exacerbating exacerbating yeah. the situation. So, you know, you need to stay into your microphone, and is, this would be a good thing to do at a rehearsal sometime, even with your pastor. Just get up there <laughs> and preach to an empty room with your sound man and let him get the right sweet spot mm-hmm. on your voice so that it really sounds great so you're mm-hmm. comfortable in a certain range or if you've got this new uh sophisticated uh, uh you know wireless microphone in a in a you know uh, uh so your hands free you need to work with that or a mm-hmm. lav same thing cuz these things are going to feed back at different uh levels it, you know get into a church take the time with your sound engineer to, to find out w- w- how this mic is going to react so you're mm-hmm. comfortable when you're preaching. And the same goes for the worship team. Yeah. Monitors are a big deal mm-hmm. um, on, yeah. on sound. Let's talk about that a little yeah, well, bit. Let, let me go back to your uh, the the uh, yeah. headset mic. That's a great point that you bring up. And one trick that uh, we can do a lot is, especially on, with these new digital mixers, um, they'll have onboard EQs. Now you have your channel EQ, which is what I use for shaping, musical shaping. And then you have your graphic equalizer, which is what we would normally tune a room with. And they have a lot more bands. There's like 31 bands on it. And you can you can uh, pull get real specific with frequencies. A lot of times on these digital boards, you can actually... There's usually like four of those graphic EQs on board, and you can actually um, assign it to the channel that the that your microphone's coming up on. So assign that mm-hmm. to the pastor's headset mic, and you can actually have a graphic equalizer in there, and you can start figuring out, okay, which frequencies are feeding back and pull those out without being so wide and, and destructive on the sound. And um, that's that's really helpful. If you don't have a digital board and you have an analog board, then you might get a little outboard graphic equalizer and put it on an insert on the channel. And that that yeah. can sell, solve a lot of problems for you. Yeah, and, it, and it's worth working with these monitors, Pastor, whether it's with your preaching or with the worship team. It's worth taking the time to... Um, to get the sound right, and you'll notice on the uh, on the general session uh, DVD where we had the whole band in the studio, Chuck took a lot of time 
and he always does before our sound check. Slow. Uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of time uh, just tweaking the uh, the the sound system, getting the monitors right, getting the the levels right, and you just got to be patient and you got to go through the process. But we we always take a lot of time doing that. If, if you watch the general session, you'll see how much time we took doing that. But uh, we're also not using monitors mm-hmm. in that in that in most of the time on stage on tour now. We're mm-hmm. we're using an in ear system. Talk right. about that a little bit. Yeah, the MyMix system is uh, a mm-hmm. wonderful system. There are there are a number of systems out. Aviom makes one, Behringer's making them now, Roland makes them, uh, there's a hearback system, number of different systems out. We've landed on the MyMix, um, which I like a lot, but the, the concept is, with these in-ear systems, is that um, every musician on the stage has their own mixer, and they're able to mix their own monitors, and they're plugged into headphones. So we've eliminated all of the speakers on the stage, which is cuts down on the stage noise uh, a lot, and it makes it cleaner for everybody up front. I don't have speakers blasting back into the microphones, and we don't have uh, the mid-range thing bouncing around on the stage and uh, and kind of hurting our intelligibility and, yeah. and all of that stuff. So love to have um, the whole band on, on ears. Yeah. And um, it also tightens up the sound a little bit because the band – it delivers it right to your ear. It's not bouncing off the walls and it's not coming from, you know, five feet away from you. So you can actually play tighter as a band because you're hearing everything right there. And again, if you've got a problem, you just reach over and, and change your mix and you can fix it without having to that, get somebody's attention. And Yeah, that uh, that doesn't work too well with a pastor uh, speaking, you know, because no. he, he's not going to be preaching with an in-ear system. Right. So you're going to have to have some kind of a monitor system there for the pastor. but If he wants it. If he wants it. Yeah. But for the worship team, uh, you know, just getting rid of these monitors on stage is a big help in 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 clarifying your sound in the building Mm -hmm. because uh, especially in a smaller building you have a church of two three hundred people the monitors are are coming this way they're hitting the back wall they're bouncing out this way and sometimes uh it is you're hearing more monitors than you are the main system Mm -hmm. so it can create just uh, a lot of problems with the sound so i'm a big fan of uh in-ear systems the caution, I would say, in an in-ear system, and they're not expensive. Uh, you can talk about that a little bit. I mean, they range from probably four thousand to fifteen thousand, or oh I don't know. yeah, less even. You know, Three. you could probably get down to two two thousand okay. dollars for a pretty good system. Two thousand uh, dollars up to twenty thousand, probably mm-hmm. in an in-ear system. But uh, the the one caution would be, you put those ears in. As a musician mm-hmm. and as a worship leader, you are in your own little world. It's a little bit like a studio. And and you you, you got to realize there's still a congregation out there that you're communicating with, and so you need to really need to keep one eye on. And and there are some systems that are more sophisticated systems that you can actually feed in audience sound, which is mm-hmm. in the to me the best of both worlds, because then you have the controlled environment with your ears, but you can hear the audience singing and responding as well because you don't want to get up here and say hey let's have a great performance we all sound great and then realize the you're totally uh, miscommunicating with the audience mm-hmm. they're like going uh what are these guys doing up there <laughs> so um anyway i'm a big fan of the in-ear systems and yeah. uh, uh i i think it'd be worth uh worthwhile yep. uh, investigating this yeah and i understand too a lot of times especially the worship leader they like to be more connected with the room and so uh it's not you know, if I'm going to compromise anywhere, sometimes it'll be for the worship leader or the singers, um, give them monitor speakers, but still put the band on yeah. the on the in ears. It, yeah. it, it helps you. It goes a long ways towards helping, um, and it gives them a little bit uh, a little bit more interaction with the room. So, yeah. I am a, a big fan of the in ear systems. Again, there are several that you can choose from different price ranges. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chuck, just tell us. Uh, how we can, um, you know, pick the right system mm-hmm. and what are we using and where can the folks go to find mm-hmm. out about it? Yeah, you know, first you start with your budget, I suppose, you know, figure yeah. out um, what you can afford um, or, you know, what you need to spend and figure out how to afford it. 
But, uh, you know, do a little research. You can go online to you know, even Sweetwater, Guitar Center, any of those, and look up in-ear systems um, or personal monitoring systems uh, or Google it. Um, the, again, you know, like I said before, you've got Behringer is making systems, MyMix, Aviom, Roland, uh, Hearback, a uh, number of systems out there. And they're all Cat5 based. They all network together and you you put... 16 channels into them or in the hearback eight channels into them and everybody has all those channels at the, on their little mixer and they can uh they can dial in their mix we've settled on the my mix and uh yeah. i like that a lot if you want to find out more about it, it's just it's it's great sounding loaded with great features if you want to find more about that go to mymixaudio.com uh, they've become good friends. They've uh, they've helped support our tours, and I've I've recommended them all over the world. And actually, I have you know people say, "What are you using?" And they've they've bought. We've sold systems in India and Africa yeah. and all over the place. And so the guys at my mix are like, "Hey, you guys are great. We appreciate you." But everybody I've talked to that's bought the system afterwards have said. Every time I call for tech support and stuff, they yeah. answer the phone and they're really helpful. And so it's a, yeah. it's a good company and we really like working yeah, with them. And, and uh, uh, amazingly, it's one of the most affordable uh, systems that we've found. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, it's durable. We go all over the world. This stuff takes a beating uh, un under the, you know, who knows what happens to it in the cargo bins of the airplane. But it takes the beating mm -hmm. all over the world touring with the stuff, and it and it really has held up well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm with Chuck. It's uh, worked really well for us, and um, I'm a big fan yep. of the of my mix system. So, um, well, to wrap things up, talk about a little bit about um, uh, how do you approach uh, a mix, mm -hmm. getting the mix. Now, on the general session, mm -hmm. uh, we 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 did. You know, of course, we're in Ocean Way. A oh, really nice studio, uh, but you were still dialing in the drums. You were dialing in the mix, and you build it like you're building a building, yeah. building a foundation. Just talk mm -hmm. about uh, the practical way that a that a sound engineer needs to deal with building this this mix mm -hmm. every week. Yeah, well, I'll tell you uh, what my perspective is on that is is that I come from the studio world, so I spent years in the studio uh, mixing records. And so with that in mind, knowing what I want to hear on how a record sounds. So whenever I'm out on the road with Don, I've had the pleasure of mixing a couple of his records as well. I'm, I'm always trying really hard to make it sound like a record. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so that's my point of reference. And if I, and if I walk away from that evening and I've, and it, and it just doesn't sound like what I wanted. I usually walk away a little disappointed, but um, so the the concept that I that I do again is making it sound like a record. The first thing you have to do is know what you want to accomplish when you're mixing a song, you know, or when you're mixing the music. Know what things are 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 foundational, where things need to sit in the mix, what you need to hear and not hear, what's what's um, what invokes emotion what uh what what best translates in the song so when i when i asked the question earlier are you a musician uh whether you said yes or no at this point if you're an audio engineer then then you need to answer yes and the first thing that uh that you've got to do is listen um listen really hard so i have the advantage of having listened to songs from the inside out one instrument at a time and analyzing each instrument but if you sit down and listen to the radio or, or to iTunes or whatever and, and get songs that you like the way they sound or, the, or worship songs that are in the genre that your church is doing, listen, listen, listen. <clears throat> Understand, where does the bass drum sit in relation to the snare drum? Where is the lead vocal next to that? Where are the guitars? You know, And you think about things like panning left and right, EQ, all of those things. The, another important thing is to... Make sure that instruments aren't getting in each other's way, which becomes that shaping thing. When I talked about EQ earlier, we use the EQ to shape things. And, you know, you can go online and find these charts of where instruments sit in the frequency spectrum. And you can look, okay, electric guitars are kind of like a high mid instrument. So they're going to pop out there. So you might, in the context of a mix, you might want to shave off some of the highs and some of the lows so that that leaves room for like the cymbals or the vocals 
or the bass drum and the bass guitar and let the guitar sit in that place so that the other instruments can sit in their places and the vocals. And so you really, you know, when I'm building a mix, I start with the foundational things, which is the low frequencies, the bass drum and the bass guitar, uh, build the drum mix around that. And then I'll move on usually to the guitars uh, after that and just placing them, getting them to sound right. And then I'll go to the keyboards and then I'll throw the vocals on top. And um, all of that, again, keeping and bearing in mind that music is an artistic expression and and it also is something that evokes emotions in people. So the best, I, I mean, I believe that God created our emotions and he, he gave us this place in our psyche where he can touch us emotionally and we can respond to him in that. And, and a lot of times he uses music to do that. So as an audio engineer, it's one thing to understand and know all the technical stuff, but you have to get to the point where you appreciate and love the art part of it too and the emotional part of it and that's you know i i will sit back at the board sometimes and and i almost get as emotional about a sonic experience as i do about a lyric experience or a musical experience so um so i'm always striving for that sonic excellence and getting something that sounds uh really good and so hopefully the audience is hearing it too you know that's yeah. that's my heart yeah uh and and i would you know, say after all these years of a uh, uh, Chuck uh, mixing sound, he's still out there uh, getting into uh, the worship experience. And and uh, like, again, we're going back to the beginning of what we talked about: how uh, much of a key having the right sound engineer in your church is. Uh, this this guy or gal, this person can make or break all that you've done. And and. And it not only skills in terms of mixing and uh, engineering, but uh, the right heart too. You, you're there uh, as a sound engineer. You're 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 the person that is responsible for the people hearing uh, the overall message, the music, and the word. And you got to have uh, you got to be called to do it, but you got to have the right skill set. You got to have the right heart for it. But uh, um, it's going to make a difference in your church. So if you don't have that person. Uh, on your team, uh, fast and pray for, that God will send the right person there. Just because a person can solder two wires together does not necessarily mean they're qualified to be a sound engineer. So we're going to pray with you and believe that God will send the right person, this critical person, to your team that will make, uh, I believe, all the difference in the world. So I'm going to ask Chuck, uh, would you pray? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll uh, wrap up the session. Yeah. Lord, thank you. Um, uh, you know, at the very beginning, we talked about your word and that it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by God's word. And so um, we just thank you, Lord, for the role that the audio engineer plays in that in the churches every Sunday, every week, um, sitting there faithfully at the board, pushing faders so that people can hear the word of God. And so I just pray, Father, that you would... Um, that you would bless them in their duties, bless what they're doing, encourage them, Father, even though they're they're only getting um, certain messages from the audience and uh, and not getting all the encouragement, Father. We pray that you would be the one that encourages them, and we thank you, God, uh, that you have equipped them and continue to equip, give new ideas. As as I'm always learning, Lord, I just pray that my brothers and sisters would always be learning more about the craft of mixing and uh, we pray father that your word would go out strong and true in every church every sunday around the world in jesus name amen amen well, chuck it's been great uh, you, i appreciate your uh, input i appreciate your uh, faithful uh, support over all the years your expertise uh, if you want to um how can people reach you uh, if they have a question, yes, um, I, I'm not going to let Chuck go out too much because he's he's busy. Uh, I like to have him out with me, but um, I always tell him he needs to write a book. 
He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I'm writing it. You are writing I've it. I've got chapters Finally, in. Yeah. after all these yeah, years, yeah. I keep telling him, Chuck, write the book. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I'm going to endorse it, and I'm going to uh, make it a requirement for everybody at my concerts to buy. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. But who gets uh, the if, how can they reach you if uh, <laughs> they want to uh, you know, bring you to their church to yeah. help work with their sound team or something like that? Yeah, chucksmix at yahoo.com. Chuck's Mix at yahoo.com. There it is right there on the screen. Uh, and if you want to um, f- find out about our rhythm section, uh, guitar techniques, keyboard techniques, I did a vocal session. It's all on the DVD series. Make sure you get all those uh, and use them in your worship team. God bless. Hope to see you real soon. <laughs>